Sure. Perfect. So thank you so much for coming along this afternoon, everyone. We are delighted to have everybody here and so many uh, people come along to share excellent practice. We are lucky because we've had a sneak peek of the presentation and also conversations with lots of you as well. Um, but we thought it'd be a great opportunity just to come along and share some practice that's already happening and to highlight the STEM Nation Award um, so that you know that you can go ahead and apply for elements one or plural um, yourselves. So yes, yeah, so I'm not going to waste any more time because you want to hear from each other rather than listening to me babbling on. So I'm just going to pass over to Lynn. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you. So that's the first short straw is that unfortunately um, we were meant to have Corrine Kirk from um, Edinburgh joining us today, but she couldn't make it. Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So um, Corrine is based in Balerno, as you can see, and um, she we're going to look at her what she did with her STEM grant through the lens of equity and equality. Um, Next slide, please. So, yeah, Karine was was recipient of one of our STEM grants, which you probably heard about over the last couple of years. We've had our STEM grant program. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like we're going to have any funding this year for STEM grants. Just the way things are, I'm afraid, with government and funding and everything else. So, um, she was one of our, our STEM grant um, awardees, and um, our like all the STEM grants, they were awarded for professional learning. So she was wanting to do um, ASN, Pupil Support and CDT at Balerno High School. And so she was very successful. It was a delight to us because we really tried to encourage a lot of the ASN um, sector to apply for grants. And we well, were often a wee bit disappointed we didn't get more applications from them because we really wanted to engage with yourselves and make sure that um, you were getting a fair share of crack of the whip of these grants that were going around. But as I say, luckily, Karine was successful and um, she got to do this with the within CDT. So she held training for, I'm not going to read a lot of the slides that Corrine's given us. You're going to get these because um, I don't know if Laura mentioned at the beginning because I was panicking over my slides. Um, this session is being recorded and you will get a, couple, a copy of the PowerPoints as well as a PDF. So you don't have to madly scribble anything down. This will all come back to you. And as I say, I'm not going to read off every single word on, on these slides. Um, but just to kind of highlight what she was doing with hers. Um, they wanted to provide training for support for learning staff in the schools within CDD department workshops um, and they wanted to focus on health and safety. Um, the objective of the grant was to provide cover so that staff could undergo the training and that was one of the advantages from the grants that we were actually able to provide funding for people to get out of school because that often is the issue is actually providing the funding for them to get in supply teachers. Getting in the supply teachers is also a second problem that we know exists out there, but we could only attack the one that, that we could actually help with. So she um, wanted to provide that. She What they, they focused on for training with the support staff was um, providing these sort of stationary pencil phone holders um, to for their students to make, but the main purpose of this was to actually do the, the professional learning for the staff to be able to provide them the training for the young people involved. Thanks, Hazel. So they identified that the, the, the pupils needed more support and that this could only be um, really uh, done through training the staff. And what they wanted to do was exercise uh, the pupils' fine motor skills and apply mass mathematics and numeracy skills. Sorry, my I, I have, was at the dentist this morning and so my I'm fluffing some of my words here because there's still a bit of numbness on the left side of my face. Um, so I do apologise for that. So um, they wanted the learning gap to be narrowed as well for their BGE level and in particular for that area of STEM. So that, and most importantly, and we say this all the time in the STEM team, to promote the enjoyment of STEM as a subject. Um, not just It's not just about the qualifications, but we've realised um, through the time that we've all worked together how much enjoyment um, young people get out of doing STEM subjects and, and actually acquiring STEM skills. So she wanted to promote that um, within the, the ASN sector in her school. Thanks, Hazel. 
the other outcome was also to foster that inclusive outcome for all the staff and pupils, improving the well-being of all individuals in the workshop. Um, they recognised that statistically most of their support for learning staff were female and they wanted to make sure that they um, got the opportunity to contribute um, to improving the awareness of STEM within what is typically a male orientated discipline. And just from the work that she's done with her grant, has meant that they have a, they have attacked equality and um, equity within their school, and that in itself would have started them quali qualifying for the first again, excuse me, equality and equity element of the STEM Nation Award. Um, Corinne, I think you saw her email addresses on the the very first slide for 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 what she was um, doing and. By all means, she's happy to be contacted if anybody wanted to discuss what she did um, with the learners and with the staff in, in her environment. I would like to see if you have any questions, ask me, but um, I, haven't, I can't answer questions on behalf of Corinne, unfortunately. Um, the most important thing, I think, is that they adopted this sustainable approach so that the training materials have been documented and uploaded in, on MS Teams with um, different partner organisations and most especially for other people to be part of. We, as part of our STEM grant programme, have encouraged anybody who has had a STEM grant with us to share any materials that they have that we will put up in our online resource, which I'm sure um, will be mentioned as we go through this workshop. Probably many of you have already heard of it, but hopefully from all the STEM grants that we did, including this one, we will have materials that we can then upload to the resource part of our online um, platform. I think that's the last slide. Yes, it is. So I'm going to hand over now to Gillian Cooper. Thank you. Hi. So I am coming at this from a slightly different point of view. Uh, I'm not a teacher in the ASN sector. I am a secondary science teacher and I'm currently seconded to the pedagogy team in North Lanarkshire. And our role is to upskill staff in whatever area it is that we work in, and that is, would be STEM for me as a secondary science teacher. And the reason I'm speaking today is because currently one of my engagements is with a school uh, and the school, are, I, I don't work for them, so I did want to check with them that they were happy for me to name and give a description of the school and they were happy with that. So one of the schools I've just started working with is Glen Cryan, which is a school for Pupils with a wide range of additional needs, I'm just checking my notes here, a wide range of additional needs, including language and communication difficulties. They have a primary and a secondary setting, and I've been working with the primary setting. What they're looking to do is bring STEM into their established curriculum, rather than it being a, here's a, a science thing or a STEM thing, and then move on from there. It has to be something that lasts um, could I have my next slide, please? That's me. And there we go. So I'm just going to speak about, and again, I just want to make it clear that with myself and Glenn Cryan, we're very much at the start of this um, working together. I'm not speaking as an expert in it, like many of the other people here this evening. I'm speaking as somebody who's starting out and we're learning together. So. Speaking about curriculum and learner pathways, progression routes, as you can see there. So it's developing that curriculum. It's where do where does it take our learners, but also do the teachers feel confident in delivering that, that, that it doesn't just become here's a STEM lesson tick. That's as we've done that for this year. It has to be more than that. And if I could have the next slide, please, I would explain that. So STEM in our schools, and this is a lot of what my role is, regardless of the school. It's I'm, for STEM, I model best practice. Generally, I go in and I do short engagements with classes, and that is CLPO, as you can see there, for practitioners. It's always, always guided by experiences and outcomes and, and benchmarks. It's not just, let's sit, think of something that sounds like science and we'll do that. It, it, that doesn't work. There are, you know, we have those experiences and outcomes and benchmarks to follow. That's what we have to be doing. But particularly for this engagement, I'm asking staff, what, what do they need? What is it that they want to be able to show in class that they can do again and again and again? 
because it's the last point on the slide shows that it's not a one-off science show from the science lady and I do get called that a lot which I'm happy with but it's not for me to come and show something really exciting bring fire bring lots of explosions everybody thinks that's amazing but what have they really learned from that well not very much it's this is this is their curriculum they're learning they're taking it forward and that's really really important that the staff feel comfortable with that and they haven't just been told that they have been consulted with and and that's a big part of what i do as well and um, could i have the next slide please so this one in particular for the current engagement with glenn crying is understanding the learners and knowing your own learning and support needs the first two points that's come from the class teachers it's that's not for me to tell them about their learners i don't know about their learners and i haven't worked in an asn environment but the clear report clear approach and the meaningful learning networks that comes from me so i've worked closely with them there's been a lot of back and forth um, via email with the principal teacher uh, i've been in to meet with her and it, just to be clear about what the pupils need it's not that the they can't that doesn't that doesn't exist it's not they can't it's what it's how do we make this accessible for them and again accessible for the staff i hear all the time from my primary colleagues that science is a wee bit scary and the science is the one i think that scares them most out of the same subjects that science is a wee bit scary and you know that's my job to make them see that it's not it's something that you can do it every day you don't need an extensive knowledge of science you need to set the the pupils a task think of it as problem solving really i say that a lot rather than just science think of it as setting them a task to figure out and get to an end point and continually why 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 does this work why did that not work why did you do this and that particularly now for esn um is very much led by the teachers because they know what their pupils, what the their expectations for the pupils are. Um, sorry if you can hear that, the ice cream man's just coming past. <laughs> um, so, so somebody will be having a nice ice cream. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. And if anyone just want new ice cream, just let me know. So I would like to, I just wanted to mention about progression. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm just laughing at Lynn, that's very good. Um, so in the STEM curriculum across the science, technology, engineering and mathematics, it's not hierarchical in the same way that the literacy and the numeracy curriculum is. You that is very step by step, but STEM is not, and I like I like to think of it as that you can be horizontal uh, as well as vertical, and um, that's what I've put there. It's the Early level science, for example, doesn't have to go along with an early level technology or an early level numeracy um, for mathematics. It can be, you can go between early and first, you can even bring in a second level. It's the it's bundling them well and what is logical. There's no point in shoehorning something in because you think actually that kind of comes under the same head and I'll just give that a wee tick. If it's not logical, it's not going to fit with the lesson and the pupils are going to know that. So don't be don't don't feel like you have to go one then two uh, or early level then first. It's not like that. It's what would what do you want to achieve in the lesson and what what you know what you know is benchmarks can come together to work for you because you don't need to fall in step by step literacy. Numerous ones are completely different. They do require that horizontal. Um, that, sorry, that vertical progression rather than horizontal. But STEM, no, it's bring them together, make them work for you. What do you want to achieve? What matches up? Um, and for me, that's where I come in to work with the school because I, I know what works best together and they can tell me what their pupils can access and we hopefully will meet in the middle. Could I have the next slide, please? And differentiation is particularly for this, for the ESN is important. It's, I've given an example there about pipetting. If the fine motor skills aren't there for pipetting, that doesn't exclude that activity at all. Just use a measuring cylinder, just upscale the volume. You still have the same effect. Again, this is where I need to hear from the class teachers is perhaps the classes are, the, the pupils do have the skills for pipetting, perhaps they don't. But what I found 
in the school is assume that you need to cater for the widest range of needs and Glencrine do have a very very wide range of needs and then it's accessible for everybody the challenge can come from the questions or perhaps giving an extra task another example I'd like to give is if you're doing I was doing an experiment with them today about indicators and rather than using spatulas to pour or to tip small quantities I just gave them a paintbrush so they just dipped the paintbrush into either it was either alkali or the acid powder or crystals and then they just tap that so that falls into the indicator solution and you can the, the children can then see that it changes colour and that's completely accessible for them it's a little bit messy you do get powder and crystals all over the desk but you know as long as you've been safe and checked it, you know check with CERC if need be that there's nothing toxic you know that's fine the children love making a mess and you know that just brings more excitement um to them and the, the color change for them is magical and depending on the level of the class you can ask them more about that it's again it's just about you know you're you're the teachers you're the experts and it's, it's also our job to bring it to the children in a good meaningful and logical way and i think the bottom point um is what i'm talking about there it, it, it's has to be moderated it has to be something that is useful for the pupils it's accessible for them and there's an end goal is it meeting their needs is it assessed against the standards it's it's more than good enough it's an excellent curriculum for our young people to access regardless of the school they're in and i think i'm now at my final slide there we are so it was just to summarise that every establishment will be different i've been working with glenn crying the next asn school i work with will be different uh, barriers are there for us to overcome that's our job as the practitioners to bring this to our pupils and those you know in schools will already have a learning network it's not about reaching out to somebody that you've never heard of you saw their name on the bottom of bottom of an email that can happen but there might be somebody in school who knows how you know how to do the things that you're wanting to do look to that look to your local mainstream schools do they have somebody that can help you or is there somebody like myself in post and it, you know you don't have to search out don't search for miles and and find people that you don't even know exist there will be people around about you that can help you and everybody brings a different expertise and that, that should all be used and it's it's doable for everybody and I, i'm learning that myself and you know i'm just at the start of doing this so i've got lots to learn from everyone else speaking this evening and thank you very much there's the ice cream on again <laughs> I will give you five minutes to in and then while I'm speaking, you can dive out and get me that um, double nugget, which are my favourite. <laughs> um, no, thank you so much, Gillian, for that. It was it was really nice to hear. I actually came from North Lanarkshire Council before I came in to um, work with Education Scotland, and a lot of what you were saying resonated with me. I was very fortunate to actually work in Glencrine at one point as well when I was out in secondment, and I shamelessly just realised it's exactly ten years since I did that secondment. So that doesn't age me at all. But <laughs> absolutely, you know, what you were saying resonated with me. The number of times I was told, even in mainstream school, about teachers being afraid of science and not wanting to take those leaps and me saying, you know, the children will take those leaps for you. You don't have you just have to put the idea on the table. Yeah. They will love every single bit of it, which is it shines through from what you were saying and it was just just absolutely lovely to hear um, what you're managing to achieve. And again, Again, I would second what you're saying about look around you. There are there are high schools out there that have equipment who are more than happy to lend you stuff um, to do these things in in your schools. Um, some more some more obliging well, than others, yeah, yeah. without a doubt. But there are there are often high schools out there that have equipment that they're actually not using. They've actually moved on perhaps to more technical stuff you know technology based stuff but there's a lot of practical stuff that they still have in their cupboards that they are probably not using and would be quite happy to lend out to to a, a, an ESN school or, or a primary school for that matter so thank you for that Gillian I'm not going to ask any questions at the moment because I want to make sure we go through everybody and then we'll maybe come back to a sort of question and answer session at the end of that, um, I'm not quite sure why the slides have gone because the slides should still be up. Um, Sorry, Lynn, I've just switched them off because we were doing a slightly different format okay. for the next one, but I can um, I can yeah, pick them up yeah. if um, you I'll want to refer Lindsay, to any of the photographs. Yeah, I'll ask Lindsay and um, Pauline how they feel about that. We've got 
you all your photographs that you sent us on slides. We're happy to display them, but we also wanted to make sure with you how you felt about that. Do you want to be on screen or do you want the slides showing the pictures of the young people? Which would you prefer? Um, so I thought I'd maybe give a wee bit of background information first and um, explain to everyone how we have allocated the grant funding um, because rather than have one big project, we've been doing like lots of um, smaller projects. So the photographs would probably make more sense once I've kind of explained all the different things that we've been doing. Yes, we'll, leave, we'll show the photographs at the end then, Lindsay, that's perfectly fine. Um, and then you can always do a wee bit of, you know, pointing out what's on each of those slides yes. as well. Um, after we discussed all these things. So yeah, as I mentioned earlier, um, Kareem was one of the recipients of our STEM grant, as was Lindsay at Camp C. There's a Camp C View, yeah, yes. Camp C View uh -huh. School. Yes, I wanted to get that right. And Pauline worked there with it as well, and they were involved in doing the STEM, using the STEM grant. And it was based very much around numeracy again to begin yes. with. But from that, you've led into STEM with that. So would you like to explain a wee bit of background about your STEM grant first? Yeah. Um, so yes, a couple of years ago, I was appointed as the acting PT for Camp C View School and my remit was to raise attainment and numeracy. So um, for my first year during this role, I, I just worked hard to provide training opportunities for our staff, revamping all of our maths resources completely. And I also provided supply cover for our teachers to have time out of class to work with targeted pupils on numeracy interventions. So this all had a really successful impact on uh, our pupils. So I wanted to extend it to other curricular areas. And that's why I incorporated STEM development into our school improvement plan for this year to allow us to focus uh, specifically on these subjects. And I also applied for the STEM grant with the aim to develop staff skills and abilities to deliver STEM teaching to pupils with additional support needs. Um, so the pupils have really benefited from the grant as it has allowed us to continue these numeracy interventions sessions that I started for another year. Uh, so what we do is we do an initial benchmark assessment at the beginning of the year. Then we identify next steps. We give teachers time to work on these next steps and one to one intervention sessions. And then we carry out benchmark assessments again at the end of the year to track the progress that has been made. And this has been so successful again this year that we decided to adapt the same model for literacy and health and well-being as well. Um, I also found out during this STEM journey, which I was all very new to, um, about STEM ambassadors through the STEM learning website. And I arranged for a, a series of something called STEM Amazing sessions that one of the STEM ambassadors was running uh, to take place with our senior pupils who are based actually at Kirkintilla High School. Um, so they took part in hands-on activities alongside a live presenter. They were learning about lava lamps, aerodynamics and rockets, which they all thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and you'll see some of the photographs of that um, once I've finished talking to you all. Our staff have also benefited from the grant funding as well because I've organised a variety of STEM related CPD opportunities for them during the course of this year. There was a, a Christmas STEM workshop, which again, you'll see a few photographs of, and that was run by CERC Early Years and Primary Team. So a lovely box was delivered to our school with enough resources for 10 teachers to take part in four different ex uh, science experiments. Um, so we were able to take part in these fantastic hands-on activities alongside live presenters again, exploring different STEM concepts that could be adapted for use at any time of the year. It wasn't, you didn't just need to use them for Christmas and also for any celebration as well. So that was really good and we, we felt like we were pupils again in a yeah. classroom, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> Even the ones on the other <laughs> side of the learning this yeah. time. Um, I was also able to source a science teacher called Adele Letong. Um, she's an engagement and outreach lead for Glasgow University Chemistry Department. And she carried out a series of science workshops. She came to our school to do that in the classrooms um, with the pupils, with the teachers observing as well. So the teachers were gaining knowledge from her and she shared her lesson plans and all her resources with class teachers and it was to, to help develop their confidence really in teaching within this mm -hmm. curricular area. So she continues to work very closely with the school and she continues to offer her support, advice and further lesson ideas whenever, whenever we ask her to. 
And um, another big thing that we used the funding for was to visit another ASN school in Aberdeen called Orchard Bray School. Um, as they, we know that they have previously been successful in their bids for a STEM grant. And we wanted to see how this had positively impacted their pupils, uh, who are very similar uh, in needs to our pupils. Um, so they demonstrated to us over the course of two days how they utilise technology within their school to ensure pupil voices are heard and also the teaching and learning approaches that work best for them, which was very useful. And they also recommended to us a very special maths training provider that they had been working with called Les Staves that some other people that work in the SN sector might have heard of. So they highly rated him for teaching numeracy to children with multiple and complex learning disabilities. So we booked him then off the back of that to train the staff at our school and Merklin School as well, who are we are due to merge with this year. Um, so everyone that took part in that training thought that he was absolutely fantastic. And he does have a book as well called Very Special Maths, which I would highly recommend um, if anybody would like to find out a bit more about him. And he continue, he's offered to continue to working with us as well in the future. Um, also, Pauline uh, started a really good initiative called Lego Therapy with her class, which she did some yeah. training on, which I think you're going to tell yeah, me about. Yeah, so um, November, a few of our colleagues um, attended the Lego Therapy training sessions and um, I work alongside another colleague in the class. So we, it was fabulous. It really was. I'm not getting paid for Lego Therapy, OK? However, it really was fabulous. And at the course, we had so much fun. And, you know, we thought our children will love this. So often we would put Lego out for our structured play activities um, and the children really enjoyed it then. So came back to school and literally the next day we were um, ordering Lego. Now, just like working out, organising how this could work in our class. So um, it's very much um, like Gillian said, knowing your children, uh, knowing your children, knowing their needs. Um, when we were at the training session, we could really see how using technology would really target our health and wellbeing targets for that for this session. Um, initially, initially, like we were looking at health and wellbeing. So yes, we um, myself and um, Holly, we worked together and um, introduced the interclass. So now again, being in an ESN setting, now we worked with individuals to begin with, um, ensuring that. Um, we could pair them now appropriately. So now we are at the stage where all children um, are fully aware. So I don't know if you know about Lego therapy. In Lego therapy, you've got three roles. You've got the engineer, you've got the supplier, and the builder. So each session, um, our children are given different roles, and some children will work with other children. Some children are at this stage just now where they work with an adult. Um, but using technology, um, we really are delighted with the progress that the children have made. Um, with health and wellbeing, they are like accepting roles, um, they're taking turns, they're sharing. Um, the, the numeracy language that comes into to Lego, to, uh, Lego therapy is fabulous. Um, their communication skills, and see, most importantly, they love it. They just really enjoy it. Um, we do Lego therapy on a weekly session, a weekly basis, um, and each session the children love it. And what we've noticed now is at the end of our um, Lego therapy session, we'll have a free play. Or we'll bring out the Lego boxes. And the children are now being much more imaginative with their building than they were previously um, before starting the Lego therapy sessions. But I really would recommend it's um, fabulous and the children just love now their weekly Lego therapy sessions. So, yeah, and again, like it's across all curricular areas, like using technology has just, um, just been wonderful. Yeah, so, um, and I think there's photographs of that as well, and yeah, like so that you'll get to see some of the children using Lego therapy in action. Yeah, um, I had a whole list of questions I was going to ask, but you've answered just about every <laughs> single one of them, um, so I don't really have much to ask you at all. Um, it's 
fantastic to hear what you're doing and it you know anybody that works in any with children at all knows how much children get out of lego so it's it's wonderful to hear about you developing that within the school and, and doing this lego therapy so i will let you just about just about to let you go through the the slides and, and talk to them i just wondered if there was anything that really if there was any challenges you faced um in in doing all this if you if you, if you can think of any challenge you faced it all sounds like it went swimmingly well, but maybe you know better yeah. than I do. It did. It has actually gone very well, but we do always have the usual challenges that we face being in a school with pupils with additional support needs, you know, addressing the needs um, of all the pupils in an ASN setting, including the pupils that require a more sensory curriculum. Um, but we do ensure that in our planning, we're responding to the individual needs of all the pupils, just ensuring that the SLAs are on board with all these new initiatives that we're, that we're bringing in and they know their role within all of these within Lego therapy because your SLAs yes. are very involved uh -huh. in that. They take yeah. on with some of the pupils one of the actual roles when they're doing yeah. that, don't they? Just making sure that they understand exactly what's now what their role is within each lesson. Um, and as you can see, a lot of our lessons now we're responding to like all needs in our class and um, we've got badges. It, we use like a lot of visuals. Um, really, it's just really knowing your children and making sure that you're planning for each of the, uh, each of the needs of, each, of individual children. Um, but that's what we do anyway as teachers. So it's really, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, it's, well, that sounds it's, it's been it, more it's, Sorry, sorry, go ahead, Pauline. No, I was going to say it's just been, um, it, it has been like, it is always a challenge setting up something that you've not used previously. However, we've really enjoyed um, yeah, and, and also seeing the children's reaction, the children's response to everything that's happened, whether it's like been Lego therapy and everything that Lindsay's spoken about beforehand, seeing the children's reaction and like the benefit that they're getting from it is definitely. Um, makes the challenge worthwhile, doesn't it? It's just, yeah. Super. Well, before I let you just go through all the photographs and have a wee word about each of those slides, um, the the one one of the people you mentioned I hadn't heard about the person that came out and did some science with the the, the young people from Glasgow University. He's only recently been given this role, and her name just kind of um, Adele came one. upon me just by accident, really one day. It's Adele L apostrophe E T A N G. And she has been given this new role as an engagement and outreach lead for Glasgow University Chemistry Department. So because she's so new in this role, she's just kind of still finding her way, really, yeah. um, which is why she agreed to come to our school and deliver these chemistry workshops. Yeah. Um, and she did it. She was being paid by the university for that because we were going to pay her as a supply yeah. teacher because she's on the supply list for Eastern Bartonshire as well. Um, but she was being paid for the, through the oh. university, which was fantastic. So, and she got all the resources from them as well. She brought everything herself and did her own risk assessment and delivered uh, the lesson plans to us as well so that we can keep them for future reference. Yeah. So she's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. she was really good. It's it's so useful to get help from outside agencies like you've done and yeah we can't advocate enough using CERC and and obviously the STEM ambassador program is a fabulous outreach program as well two other well one other name I'll mention um you mentioned about um Les the maths guy and I was he's a character and a half and yes. I remember uh, Laurel correct me if I'm wrong here because we were in the same session you know, the man, he's not a young man, and I can say that as somebody who's just about to retire. He's not a young man, but his enthusiasm for doing maths um, with ESN learners is, is quite something to behold. The other person I know of is Jane Essex in Strathclyde University, who also does quite a lot of outreach work. Um, and she is absolutely passionate about doing science with ESN learners as well. So just, just throwing that in as another con contact but what i'll do i know sorry sorry hazel yes i will move on can we just let them just quickly flick through their photograph slides um because i did talk over that sorry Yep, so this is every year, I didn't mention this actually, we, for as part of Maths Week Scotland, we have a different theme 
Um, so in my first year as the acting PD for Numeracy, Estate, we had all the fun of the fair as the theme. And we decided to top that off with this year's Mass Week Scotland with um, the magical world of Harry Potter theme. So it was just lots of activities that um, we set up in the playground, all related to magic. We had the witch's kitchen, the um, the potion shop and things like that. And it was all different activities to do with numeracy, which the pupils absolutely loved. And the weather was good to us, which helped. So, <laughs> yeah, that's what that slide is. This was the Christmas STEM workshop for staff that um, CERC sent us the box of all the resources for, and they said that we could keep anything that was left over, which was fantastic. There's Pauline making I know, some hand as you can See, all the staff really enjoyed that, <laughs> <laughs> and we're so keen to come back to their own class and. Uh -huh. and yeah, no, they, all the staff loved it. And actually off the back of that, one of the teachers um, went back to her class and they decided to do a whole theme on uh, cause and effect experiments because she was so inspired by it. So it's really well worth doing. Uh, National Numeracy Day, that was last week or yeah. week before. So again, um, I gave some of the teachers some ideas for activities they could do. And we had another whole maths related day, which the pupils really enjoyed. Just amazing sessions. So this was um, this was through Teams, and again, we just had to prepare some really simple, um, ex like resources, like empty bottles and things like that, paper, pencils, and the the pupils got to make different things to do with lava lamps and exploring aer aerodynamics and making rocket ships, and they absolutely loved it. So I'd recommend STEM amazing sessions through that. Um, the STEM ambassadors. The chemistry, chemistry workshops. Chemistry. That's what um, the a teacher day. Adele was doing. So she went round several classes a day. I think it was a cabbage experience. Yeah, that's right. Cabbage. That's right. Cabbage. And the children were um, mixing different um, solutions to create different colours and mm -hmm. really enjoyed the um I think they painted a rainbow yeah. at the end with the different painted colours that they've made with the, the red cabbage yeah. changing its pH yeah. levels of exactly. yeah. And then and again that. here's Lego therapy and you can see um at the top of um included the badges that we use the badges um I've also got symbols on it so um, to support the children. We display the posters at the top, obviously they're not as small as that, but we display them in our class and you can see the some of the children like to wear badges, some don't, they just put it in front of them. Um, we've got different um, levels of um, creations to build and you can see the, the follow-up book. So we, when we came back from the Lego therapy sessions, we went into Lego shop, bought a, a Lego set suited to the needs of our, the children within our class and took pictures and step by step they talked to one another um, or um, like communicate with one another and um, they build their creation at the end of it. I don't know if there's a picture there that they'll always give one another a high five and say well done. So yeah it's, it's great fun you can see that they're all enjoying their Lego therapy sessions. I think that was the last one. Yeah. Right that's yeah yeah that's it well, thank you thank you both very much and you were nervous about even coming on here and the pair of you could have talked for the full section <laughs> which would have been marvelous but i'm going to move on now and hand over to Catherine. hopefully we might have a wee bit of time at the end but i'm doubting it now um a wee bit of time at the end to come back to you in case anybody's got any questions but remember if you've got any questions put them in the chat hopefully people can answer them for you there in case we run out of time Catherine, i'm going to hand over to you Excellent. Could you swap the next slide so I don't have to look at my own face? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I'm speaking to you as a slightly, again, a slightly different role. Um, I'm the STEM coordinator for Downey High School, um, which is a secondary school in Falkirk Council. Um, and as part of that, we have what we call the Additional Support Centre. It was previously known as Northfield, um, but the name's changed over the last couple of years, um, where we have pupils that are not quite mainstream um, but not eligible for sort of Karen Grange which is our, our local um, additional support school. So these pupils usually suffer um, with sort of anxiety um, alongside their um, 
oh my words have gone out of my head, um, their ASD diagnosis is. So we are trying to bring them into mainstream by the time they hit third year. So they are separate um, and they have their own separate spaces and separate classrooms and separate curriculums um, up until S3, which is when we start to incorporate them into our mainstream classes so that they can then go on for qualifications um, where appropriate for them. So part of my job is to obviously coordinate STEM across the whole school, which includes making sure that our ASC pupils are included in as much, if not all, of our STEM activities um, as possible. So I'm just going to speak to you very briefly about some of the things that we do um, here in order to make sure that STEM is accessible to all of our pupils. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So one of the first things that we do is we look at sort of our in-school support. So how can we make sure that our ASE pupils can access the activities that we're doing um, with the whole school? Uh, one of the main things that we do is our STEM club, uh, which we're very proud of. It runs every Wednesday. Um, and at the moment, we actually have more ASE pupils um, that come regularly than our other pupils. Um, all we do, though, to make this more accessible to them is small adjustments. Um, so we let them help us plan what's coming next so they know what's happening. They can decide what they want to be part of. Um, and we do allow other pupils to get involved in the planning process, but we make sure that our ASE pupils um, know about our plans in advance to make sure that they are happy with what's going on and um, particularly if we're doing loud activities so we've done so fire explosions and things like that um, and our ASE pupils mostly will refuse to come to those that don't like the big loud bangs so knowing in advance that that's what's happening on that week allows them to access the activities that they want to um, and avoid the activities that they don't and we also make sure that there's a buddy to move them between the ASE um, and the classroom where STEM club takes place. Uh, they do struggle with moving around the corridors at the same time as the rest of the school population. So we make sure that they've got a buddy um, and that they're either away just before or just after the bell um, and make sure that we're communicating with their teachers regularly so that their teachers know what is that we're doing at STEM club so they can build on that learning um, within their sort of classrooms. One of the other things that we enjoy doing um, as a school is we love, we like putting on these career fairs. They're getting quite big. Um, although there was a little bit of a, a break with COVID, we use the STEM ambassadors from STEM learning um, and lots of our parents get involved and people around the community come in and talk about what jobs they do. Um, so again, in order to make sure that the ASC have access to this, they are given the list of stalls beforehand they get the chance to sit and have a chat with their teachers and with me um, and with some of the ambassadors if they're available before the events um, so that they can decide who they would like to speak to most and we can facilitate that on an individual pupil basis but also we can work them in groups if that's what they want to do and um, we make sure that they've got questions and discussion points in advance whereas we don't do that with the general school population. We like that those conversations to be a little bit more natural. Um, but with ASE pupils, they find it easier um, to engage with what's happening if we make sure that they've got their questions and discussion points. And we share that with the visitors as well um, so that everybody knows what they're going to want to talk about um, and nobody's left on the back of it feeling a wee bit sort of out of place. Uh, we also make sure that they've got quieter transitions um, moving from station to station because it does get quite loud when you've got whole year groups moving around um, and talking to other people and demonstrations and things going on. So we make sure that there's additional breaks um, and just a space away from all of the noise and the hubbub of what's going on at the career sphere to allow them to access it, but also to come away when they need to so that they don't feel overwhelmed and then lose enjoyment of the activity. Um, could I have the next slide, please? One of my other favourite things to do is to find all of the new and exciting things that other people are doing. Um, so one of the ones that we've enjoyed the most is the Salters Trust festivals. Um, these are chemistry festivals that happen through Strathclyde. They haven't restarted since COVID, which is a shame. Um, 
I have sent a number of emails to them to see if there's anything in the pipeline. So hopefully something will come back up. Um, but we do enjoy taking the kids out to extracurricular events. It does take a wee bit more planning, um, just in terms of making sure that they are accommodated for in the external places. The Salters Trust one was specifically for autism spectrum disorders um, and it had everything in place there. It was there was additional support staff there. We were also allowed to take additional staff out of school with us um, so that they had the opportunity to go to a university lab and do the, the actual chemistry festival that's open to the general population, but just specifically for ASD um, settings. It was really good fun. And again, I'm really hoping that they, they bring something else back. Um, and we just make sure that we have subject specialist staff available to our support specialist staff um, if they are wanting to take pupils out for different trips and things we will this year we've got them booked in to go and talk to talk engineering with the three bridges over the fourth and um, so that should be good fun as well um, and again it's just a case of making sure that we're taking the time um, to let everybody know what's going on in advance whereas normally what happens when I'm planning something like this Everything's all crazy right at the last second. Um, but we have to make sure that that's not the case when we're planning to take the ASD out anywhere um, or include them in our plans. Uh, next slide, please. One of the other things that we've been working really hard for, and we used some of our grant money um, to facilitate uh, sending our STEM ambassadors. So one of the things that we have at Denny that sort of makes everything work really, is we have pupil STEM ambassadors. So our S6 pupils are working on their higher leadership, their YSL leadership projects. Some of them are doing science baccalaureates. And we're using that time, their curricular time for that, to do outreach, to go and work with our cluster primaries, or in this case, uh, Karen Grange High School, which is our ISN high school, five minutes down the road. Um, so we've been taking our STEM ambassadors over there and worked on a bunch of different lessons um, about video game design, which was actually really quite interesting because our kids didn't know anything about it. Our STEM ambassadors are not computing experts in by any stretch of the imagination, and they were all very nervous about doing it. But by going and allowing um, the Karen Grange pupils to teach our kids it was just a nice sort of a different sort of spin on it um, and they got into really good working relationships and um, their leadership skills were fantastic and their teacher was really worried about us lot coming in and how it was going to upset the balance of their classroom and even though we'd spoken sort of through technologies and all of this kind of stuff um, actually taking them was I think quite stressful for their teacher but it worked really well and they really enjoyed having the opportunity to sort of boss ours around and let them know that they knew the best. And um, it wasn't a case of us coming in and just showing them something. They had to teach us how to do it first. Um, it also let our ambassadors have sort of natural conversations with them about careers and sort of what their plans were when they were leaving school and having sort of natural conversations like that, which is really lovely. Um, and is something that we've already started planning for for this coming session. It'll be something that we'll continue doing um, moving forward as we we're starting to STEM 2.0 um, for this next year. So it's quite excited um, to see where that goes. So yeah, it's slightly different take on sort of what we're what we're doing, but more than happy to answer any questions about what's going on there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Katie. Um, if anybody's got any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. And if we've got any time at the end, we'll um, follow up or we can follow up with emails as well. Um, and I'll just hand over to our last speaker for today. Um, Claire, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Thanks, Hazel. Uh, thanks, everyone. It's, I've really uh, enjoyed listening to what everybody's doing. Um, and I can uh, Probably the, the cabbage thing. I personally have become obsessed with cabbage indicator. It's really cool. I keep trying to tell everyone about it. And Lego, as will be seen in this talk, was a big hit with, with our staff as well. 
Um, so I'm slightly a uh, on a slightly different track here. So I work. I'm the STEM coordinator for Glasgow Life, uh, who are basically the interesting but not counting education of Glasgow City Council. So we we do libraries, communities, sports, music venues, and so on. Because uh, quite often I will say to people, "We're going to put this Glasgow Life." Um, you like the next slide? Um, so we were. I, I was actually doing this project with the staff from Lynn Park Adventure Playground. Uh, so Lynn Park Adventure Playground is a Glasgow Life facility, which is, is part of Lynn Park, um, but it's completely enclosed. So there's a, a centre and um, the, this wee bit of the park you can see here, uh, there's sort of garden bits. They have garden volunteers who, who work specifically with gardening and planting. Uh, there's some specially adapted equipment for children with um, who are say, using wheelchairs so that they can get their wheelchair in the swing um, and on roundabouts. Uh, we've got this kind of disc here you can see in the photo where people stand and you can walk around it and it, it kind of walks around. Apparently this is very popular. Um, the main uh, sort of selling point for Lynn Park, so to speak, is with, with the families who, who use it, is that it, because it is completely enclosed, it is designed for uh, children with additional needs of varying sorts. Their children are able to come and just run around the park um, because they, they have quite a lot of children um, with autistic spectrum disorders and quite often they wouldn't be able to be able to just run around freely in another Park just in case they they run out into something dangerous. So apparently the the, the parents and and the the children really appreciate it uh, for that reason. Uh, one of the so the, there's kind of two things at the weekends and during school holidays. It's used by families coming uh, who have one of their children uh, has a disability, but during the weeks they have school visits and sometimes it's ESN schools and sometimes it's mainstream schools with some ESN pupils who are part of the school groups. So it's quite a, a mixed range eh, of children who are using it. The staff had mentioned as well that previously in sort of earlier years they had a lot more children with physical disabilities but because they're now more often mainstreamed and you know in, in the the mainstream schools, they get more children coming um, with autistic spectrum disorders. So it's the, the sort of children coming has, has changed slightly over the years. Um, can I have the next slide, please? I feel like Chris Whitty on the, the news or something here. Um, the initial sessions in this, this was actually before we, we got the grant, uh, was last spring uh, 2022, Janet Bean, who was a, one of the sort of associated managers with the park and the volunteers there, had asked me to come along and run some a couple of sessions on STEM activities with the Lynn Park staff and some of the other community staff who work with children um, and families in community centres and police centres uh, in the organisation. The staff were initially, I think they were all feeling a wee bit sort of dislocated and dis disconnected because it was immediately coming out of the lockdowns over COVID and a lot of them had just been not able to do anything over that time because all their centres were shut or things had been very, very restricted. So it was to try and get the staff feeling, you know, a bit of sort of team building, a bit it sort of enthusiasm about things. And initially they they were quite hesitant, very initially, because as, as various other people have mentioned, the the quite often when I come in and say I'm the STEM coordinator, people sort of reel back in horror and fear that I'm going to make them do something terrifying, which uh, I, I try and uh, make them feel a bit more comfortable about this. Uh, Janet had actually a really good suggestion for this, which was to if I gave them um, a just sort of two line description of the activities we were going to do with a wee photograph next to it. And apparently that really helped. So that kind of just disambiguated it a wee bit, made it a bit less mysterious and alarming sounding. And in fact, the staff were really enthusiastic. They took to like complete naturals, just were just so keen to get in and try things. 
they ask really interesting questions. They related it to um, other activities they themselves had done or experiences and skills they had. One of the, the activities that was uh, talked about particularly and raised a lot of questions was this one you can see in the photos here, the, the shadow towers where you, uh, you, know, you sort of build up a, a tower of some description out of Lego. Um, and on a piece of paper, draw around its shadow. I'd, I'd done this before um, in February, where there wasn't a lot of sunshine, so we did it with torches to get the, the sun effect. So you, you, you can kind of do it with, uh, both ways. But it was a sunny day, so we did it outside. And so you then you'd wait a few minutes, and obviously the, the shadow would change because the, the sun had moved, or rather the earth had moved, but the position of the sun was now different. And that generated a lot of discussion. Um, several of the staff had mentioned uh, the, the idea we were talking about sundials and the, the, the gnomon being the, the shadow casting uh, part of the sundial. And one of the, this team, the, the, the centre manager had said, would it be possible to have a sundial where the children could be the gnomon? And I had no idea actually, but one of the volunteers said she'd seen a sundial like that quite near the Kelpies. And it turns out we sort of looked it up and it turns out there's this thing called an analomatic sundial um, and it's based on the, the sort of sun's elliptical path through the, the sky over the, the, the course of the year. Um, and I've got a picture on the, the next slide in just a second, but that was really interesting. Oh, sorry, it's not quite that slide. <laughs> in a couple of slides, I've got a picture of it. Um, that was interesting. Again, the staff here are, are not teachers. They're um, sort of delivery staff in Glasgow Life who have worked with, with children and families a lot over the course of their careers. They don't necessarily have any training particularly. Um, you know, they don't have necessarily lots of qualifications or anything. And they, they did tend to be a wee bit anxious at times about they, they wanted a wee bit more support of, of in terms of being able to deliver these things to people visiting the park but they were really enthusiastic generally and one of the the issues that we were coming up against which will be familiar to everyone is that uh, currently we have no budget in fact i think like like many local authorities you know glasgow life was in a, a really kind of low budget situation after the pandemic. Um, so we didn't have, I had some kit that I used for the, the STEM training sessions, but I didn't have any that we could leave with the staff there so that they could try delivering these these things. So um, can we move on to the next one? Slide please. Ah, oh, thank you. So this is where the STEM grant came in. So this enabled us to buy materials for doing the training itself so that the staff could practice with it and also then subsequently running activities when people came to the, the park. And they were discussing this thing, it wasn't always the children with disabilities they were going to be working with, some of the time it would, but because it's a family centre, quite often families would come and the child with additional needs would be happy just to sort of run around the park, but their brothers and sisters would be really bored and be kind of kicking about because there's not an awful lot, you know, there's not a lot of equipment and it's it's not um, necessarily geared for maybe even slightly older children or children without additional needs. So having things to engage them with, they were also quite keen to do that and that the, the, the uh, child with additional needs could be drawn in because their family were already taking part in this. And it also fed into the idea of the STEM capital. So one of the things that predicts whether uh, children go on to do STEM careers or to study it uh, further uh, isn't so much whether they find it um, interesting or they're good at it or they think it's useful or they think it would be nice to work in that area. It's whether they have someone in their family or close family connections who is involved in STEM and the family talk about it at home. So this is a study done by um, Professor Louise Archer. Um, I think she's at Imperial College or is it UCL in London now? She was at uh, King's in London for a while. 
Um, so it's, it's a project called Aspire, and this was the, the sort of major takeaway from uh, this particular project is that what the family talk about, whether the family considers STEM as something that they discuss, it's something that the children can see themselves doing. Um, so that was something that we were really keen uh, to to get the staff to to work with the, the, the families generally, because it's you know it's not even just talking to the children themselves; it's getting the whole family involved and trying things out and just having fun with it. Um, so we got the grant for the extra training, the kit, and also this enable just to do our sundial. Um, some training from Glasgow Disability Alliance and a set of activity sheets that um, I put together specifically for uh, this project and which um, I did sing to, um, oh that's the one here, so yeah it's a really interesting project. Um, so yes, so there you are. Could I have the next slide please? Ah, so this is our sundial here. So there's a website that I found online on Instructables where the person doing it has got really detailed instructions of how to create an analytic sundial where you stand, you can see in the middle here that uh, this is Lorraine, the centre manager, painting in the months of the year and so you have to stand on the right part, the right bit, so if uh, we're in May at the moment, so we'd be standing in May which is quite near the centre, our Shadows are quite short at the moment because the sun's quite high in the sky, so you need to be quite close to the semicircle with the hours on it. Um, sort of in the winter, January, uh, December, your shadow is, you know, you know, is, is much longer because the sun's so much lower in the sky. And this, the position of the sun in the sky was something that various members of the team, when we were having this discussion in the first sessions, was something that they were very aware of and had absolutely observed, you know, just in their daily life. Um, so it has a website where you just put in your um, GPS longitude and latitudes. What time zone you're on, that is really important. I forgot once and got the most peculiar looking diagram. Um, and also you then need to, it just prints off its four pages of instructions. So first is find a true north, which I hadn't realised before this is different from magnetic north. Um, one of the team had also done a lot of orienteering, so he was able to help us with the compass to locate true north from magnetic north. Although in the UK at the moment there is very, very little difference between these that would come within the margin of error. Um, then the rest is done basically with rulers, um, a long measuring tape and some a cunning thing involving people holding two pens or pencils and a long loop of string that you put some chalk in and that gets you your ellipse for the times. So the, whole, the whole method and the instructions are really easy to follow but really cunning. Um, and then we painted it in with, with playground paint which is very sticky stuff. Um, it's actually surprisingly effective. So in the first photo there you can see Lorraine standing and I think that was taken about 10.42. So despite the fact that obviously any human being doing this is going to cast a much wider shadow than you know your, your average gnomon would, but it's it's actually quite accurate. So we were we were really pleased with our sundial. Um, and it was in it already, as soon as we put it up, it was attracting attention from children, apparently. Although they'd not quite managed to line up interested children and a day when it was sunny happening at the same time. So it, it made the, the explanations a bit more difficult. Um, can we have the, the next slide, please? So yes, yeah, so the audience, as I was saying, it, it varied. Some were going to be children from visiting schools. A, some of whom may um, have additional support needs, but not all did. Uh, children visiting with families and siblings of children with additional uh, needs who may otherwise be sort of kicking around, going, oh, I'm bored, uh, in the way of siblings, you know, whenever you take your brothers or sisters to do something that you're interested in. Um, this was a, a picture of one of the activities, was a, a sort of scavenger hunt that you could do in the, the park itself. Um, 
I think you, a lot of the, the team here had brought back several of the things that I told them not to bring back anything with a face. So they didn't bring me a squirrel eh, or a worm, which was good. But, um, but that went down quite well. And they also had lots of ideas for how they could have different takes on this scavenger hunt and adjust it and so on for different children, different times of year. Eh, could I have the next slide, please? So the resources we we used are actually, again, the, the links are in the, the sort of slide notes, which uh, Hazel and everyone are going to send. It's something called the Starnet Library STEM Activity site. So this is an American organisation with a, an excellent name, Starnet Libraries. And it was I was introduced to it by a woman called Kellyanne Leconte, who was a Fulbright scholar who was over in from the US visiting um, Edinburgh University mainly. But she came through to Glasgow to, to talk to me and various other people over here. And the Starnet uh, programme is designed for librarians and other staff in US libraries who want to run STEM activities for their, their customers or clients, you know, visitors to the library, but have no STEM experience themselves and so no sort of training in, in science backgrounds. Uh, so obviously, again, like we, we had said to uh, our Coquitlin part that we, we could, there were STEM ambassadors. I meant to mention we had actually been put in touch with an excellent sounding STEM ambassador who was an astrophysicist and studied the sun using NASA satellites. But unfortunately, our major um, issues we had with this was internal scheduling problems uh, that again, due to sort of budget issues and staffing issues after the pandemic trying to be sorted out and general rearrangements uh, within the organisation. By the time we'd sorted out our dates, it wasn't dates that she could do, so we had to fall back on me, um, which wasn't quite as good, but it was best. We got it done anyway, although it would have been really nice if we could have had her STEM ambassador because she sounded really fascinating. Um, yeah, so the, the, the Starnet libraries their resources are for people who don't have any STEM background and their major thing, apart from they have a, a brilliant site with where you can see browse and filter. So you can browse by age range of group, um, subject matter, cost of materials, which again was a big thing for us because we don't tend to have a lot or any budget a lot of the time. So having things which are, you know, zero to five dollars or, you know, zero dollars is, is as it's, it's an American site, was really useful. So, um, and you also do it by time, you know, what groups of people and so on. So that, that was, was really useful. They have something called the guide and the side approach. So rather than being the sage on the stage where you're, you know, you're telling people things, you're the guide and the side, you're there purely to help the, the children and their families explore what's going on. It's, it's about asking questions, observing things, you know, trying to come to some conclusions. What do you think will happen if we do this? Which, um, I, mean, I, I mean, I think that has changed quite a lot at school. Obviously, to a certain extent, you have to tell them what's going on, but it's very much more of what happens in real life, scientific experimentations and discoveries and so on. Everybody is not sitting there in their, their labs going, ah, oh, yes, I've just had a brilliant idea. That's that problem solved. It is very much, you know, we have tried a thousand different things. These ones didn't work. Ah, right, this one has finally worked. Or we tried that and something went wrong with it. But that was a really interesting discovery because we found this new thing that we weren't expecting. Trying to encourage people, yeah, not, not to have the, the idea. Another sort of ongoing issue with science is that people get the notion that it is something for geniuses. And again, this is something covered a lot by um, the Aspires project. They looked into this a lot. That was people tend to think, oh, it's something for people who are geniuses. But in fact, it's usually just for people who are very, very persistent and ask a lot of questions, the sort of questions that Probably as a child, you would have stop asking so many questions, but that's what scientists do. Why does it do that? But why does it not do that? Let's keep trying it until it works or we get something that, that you know, we, we want to see what's happening. So that that's very much the um, 
the Starnet approach to things, which which worked really well with the. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll move on. So, can I have the next the next slide, please? Yeah. So this is just the uh, activity sheets. These are based again. These are mainly drawn from the Starnet materials. The link to these at the bottom is just a sort of quick rundown of what are we doing, what areas of STEM does it cover, uh, what equipment, how do we do it, and over the page some information on you know, just a really sort of brief description of what is actually happening and things to think about. You know, what would happen if we did this? Can you try doing that? Uh, think about that, that that kind of thing. So it's it's very, very open ended, very observational. Um, and again, it's just so that the, the staff had these available and didn't have to memorise stuff, which also was making them a bit anxious. If necessary, they could fall back on having this as a bit of a, a bit of a prompt. So yes, so that's 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 it. Thank you very much for for letting me chat and ramble on slightly. So and thanks for to everyone else. Thanks so much, Claire. No need to apologise. We're just um we've got a wee chat and we were just sort of going right we need to keep an eye on time but we didn't want to interrupt because we've just been like so enthused hearing from everybody um what what we did want to just touch on really quickly um we have a wide group of practitioners with us this evening some people from mainstream settings some people from cld um but but what we're really trying to promote and encourage um is more practitioners from the SN sector to, to get involved with the STEM Nation Award programme. Um, so you'll have noticed when we've been going through the um, speakers today, um, we'd asked them to sort of touch on some of the different elements of the STEM Nation Award programme, but, but speak more broadly about their experience. And we really just wanted to highlight to you and to everybody else that, that you're working with, um, that, that the STEM Nation Award programme is there to support your STEM planning and improvement journey th through STEM. Um, so I'll, I'll not go through this in a huge amount of detail. We'll, we'll send out the slides. The most important thing is that link is there that will allow you to register. When you register for the award programme, you're not committed to anything. It doesn't cost anything at any point. But if you go onto the website and register, our team at Education Scotland know that it's something that you're interested in taking forward. So what we can do is we can connect you up with your regional STEM education officer um, and any aspect of the programme that you're interested in taking forward. We can work with you. We can, um, like we've done today, we can reach out to practitioners that we know from other settings that might be able to share their experiences um, and we, we can support you through that, that journey to, to help you explore STEM and, and think about that in terms of your um, school and setting improvement priorities as well. Um, so our email address is on there as well. We really would love for you to get in touch to sort of explore that further. And I'll just hand over to Laura really quickly, who's going to wrap up. Perfect, thank you very much. And it will be a really quick wrap up. So just to say, as an echo what Lynn and Hazel have said as well, really blown away by everything that's been shared tonight. And we wish that we had more time and actually could do sessions on each of, of the things that have been shared. So thank you very much for your time. If you could fill in your evaluation at some point, that would be fantastic. And just to say a huge thank you. And now you're all let off the hook to go and enjoy the sunshine. Apologies for running over slightly on time, um, but it was really valuable. It was fantastic.